Hello there. Welcome to this video where you get to learn more on how you can approach various GMAT questions in the GMAT exam. In these videos, we do select questions from various topics and we work through them together with you to show you how you can approach the questions using various strategies as you learn better approaches and also probably gain a better understanding on how you can do so. My name is Joshua Obuya, trainer and a mentor with the Kenya Edit Program under the GMAT training section. Welcome aboard and I hope you will learn more. Thank you. In this video, I'd like to look at how to approach various data sufficiency inequality questions. These are questions on the GMAT exam, which are all inequality topics, but they are now geared towards the data sufficiency. For once, uh, data sufficiency, I find them to be some of the frameworks that you can get in the GMAT exam. The reason why I say so is because they're pretty much uh, a, a, a quick a quick solution kind of questions. You don't need to work so much to the very end of an answer to get to get a correct answer or not. So you can really save quite some time with in the, with the data sufficiency questions. So let's take a look at them at the questions just right away. So first of all, before I get to the questions themselves, maybe. Just, just a quick overview of what the data sufficiency methodology will be. This for the benefit for those who may not know it. First of all, you need to know the concepts. That is the first thing for you to be able to approach these questions correctly. Know the concepts that are tested. Secondly, you need to determine what constitutes sufficiency. Then third, assess each statement independently. And then from there, now you can pick your. You can actually now make it, pick your answers. And uh, given the choices that you have, the GMAT exam is quite unique in, in terms of how you should select your answers. If you find the first statement to be sufficient, and then let's say how we uh, find the first, the first statement to be sufficient, you don't need to go ahead and actually consider other choices. You can cross out, let's say you have A, B, C, D, and E, as stated below. If you find the first one to be sufficient, and that means what you do next is to do what? You cross out answer choice C and E. What does C and E say? They say that both statements together are sufficient, but neither statement alone is sufficient. Because this second part has been ruled out. Yeah. Statement E, what does it say? Statements one and two together are not sufficient. These two have been ruled out. So you don't need to go through this extent. So you rule out these two answers. At the same time, also, you can rule out the answer choice B because what does it say? Statement two alone is sufficient, but one is not sufficient. So that leaves you with the only two answer choices that you can pick from A or D. The moment you find the first one to be sufficient. If now you go ahead and find the second one to be sufficient, then I do what you cross off answer A and the answer choice becomes D. What if D is, what if actually the second statement is not sufficient? If it's not sufficient, then you cross out answer choice D and you're left with A. That is the approach you're supposed to use when selecting answer choices in all data sufficiency questions in the GMAT exam. Now, let's say you have, it's, a, it's actually not the other way around, uh, A, B, C, D, and E, and you find the first statement be not sufficient. Statement two, sorry. The first one is not sufficient. If it's not sufficient, you cross out answer choice A and D. Those are the first ones you cross out. But you can't cross out B, C, and E because you haven't assessed the second statement yet. If you assess the second statement and find it to be sufficient, then at that point, what do you do? You can select your answer choice as E and then you cross out C and E. Yeah, that is how you go about the selection. If actually the second one is sufficient, and the first one is not sufficient. How about if at all it is the other way around? Second statement is not sufficient either. If it's not sufficient, then what do you do? You actually go ahead and close off the second one, B, and suggest B if this is not sufficient, close off the second one, and look at the C or E. At this point, you can consider the statements together. And then you see, if both of them together are sufficient, but neither alone is not sufficient, then actually cross off and suggest E, and the answer becomes C. But what if you still combine them together and you find that they're still not sufficient? At this point in time, if that, if that is the case, then you'll cross out answer choice C 
to the left with the answer choice E as your correct answer, which means you need more information to be able to determine its efficiency. This is normally the answer choice issue uh, selection criteria, which you should have in your head. And this is what the GMAT exam actually looks out for. So if you don't go by these rules, you may as well find yourself selecting the wrong answer, not because you do not know, but because you select the wrong methodology. Yeah. So now let's dive into the questions and see. The first category of questions we'll see are sub 600 level questions. These are questions which students don't have difficulty getting the correct answer. And therefore they, they are actually being deemed to be of easy, of easy difficulty. So let's take a look at this question, pause the video, attempt it, and then you can resume it and we look at it together. So first category of questions are questions which are in the sub 600 level of difficulty. These are questions which many students don't have a challenge getting the correct answer. That's why they are deemed to be of easy difficulty. So why don't you go ahead, pause the video, attempt this question, then you can unpause, we attempt it together. Now we're being asked that is x and y, is x times y the absolute value? Is it greater than x squared times y squared? If I remove the negative sign from x and y and you multiply them together, will that value be bigger than if you had to square x and multiply the square of y? That's what this question is asking now. So before we go to the, 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 the statements and examine them, what would determine sufficiency? Uh, what scenarios do we have that could make the value of a number multiplied by a different number be less than the square of it? That's actually what you're looking at. If x and y multiply together and they're less than the squares of each of them, what conditions would we need to be satisfied by the numbers to be able to achieve this? So given the number of properties that we are aware of, if you square a fraction, a fraction squared, if you square it to be less than the number itself. Fraction, yeah, then the original fraction. Fraction, let's say now original. Let's say original, yeah. That's what is up. That's, so that's, that's, that's a fact that you do know. For instance, if you have a quarter a half and you square it, you'll get a quarter. A quarter is less than a half. That is one situation which, which, which you normally have. And the fraction needs to be less than one. That is the other condition which needs to be fulfilled. Because if the fraction is greater than one, then it won't satisfy this. If you square that fraction, it will be less. It will actually be greater than that number. So only fractions less than one are the ones which, if you square them, they will be less than their original number. Also a fraction or decimal less than one that is what you're looking at. If at all it's greater than that, you won't have that condition being satisfied. You can try that out and confirm. So with that given, that means that x has to be a fraction less than one, uh, less than, greater than zero, but less than one. The absolute values that is, yeah. And y, the same. y also has to be greater than zero and less than one. That is the absolute values because if I check the negative side, it will not be the case. But nonetheless, the absolute values of each of them have to be less than less than one. That is what you, that's, what, that's what you mean. So if you have these conditions being satisfied, then actually we do have what do we have? We do have x squared and y squared being being actually equivalent to that. That is what we do. We'll be looking out for. So now we can go ahead and examine our statements. Are the x absolute values of x and y less than one? That is what we're looking at. They less than one, the absolute values. If we get that in the statements, then that statement would most likely be sufficient for both x and y. So the first statement states that x squared is less than a quarter, but greater than zero. That means x squared could be one of our nine, would be what, uh, let's say one over nine, or one over 16, one over 25, etc. So on and so forth, because this one's now will actually be, if actually you find the square roots of each of them to be the values of x, you'd get a third, a quarter, a fifth, and so on and so forth. And if either, either way also, if you get also, if it also be the negative side of it, also be negative a third, negative a sixteen, negative a quarter, negative a fifth. If you get the absolute value of x, it will be less than one. But what about the value of y? The value of y, you don't know. So y can be any number. If y can be any number less than one or greater than one, then that is actually makes this not sufficient because in that scenario, 
If you multiply them, you will not, you may not get the same answer because it will be greater than one. You break these boundaries. If Y breaks the boundaries of one, then it won't be sufficient. So the first statement in itself is not sufficient. So in that case, now we rule out answer choice A and D. So this is the choice. And in the second case, second statement, now let's look at it. Zero is less than Y squared is less than one over nine. So now zero, now for y now in this case, y squared now takes the values from, let's say outside one point, or, or one over nine. That's what it takes, so 16, uh, one over 25, and so on and so forth. It can be one over 36, and so on and so forth. That could be the value of y in this case. So now that could be y. If I'm looking at it, then in that case, uh, then that could be now the value of y. If that is the value of y, then of, of y squared rather, then y could be, Either of those. So y could be the boundaries that we are expecting, which is less than less than one, but but greater than zero. That would be the world value of y, absolute values of y, because it can be either negative or positive. For that reason, it will be sufficient for the value of y. But how about the value of x? Since we don't know the value of x, we cannot guess what that value is. So this in that case also we do say that this in itself is not sufficient. So if you roll out this answer choice b because two alone is not sufficient. Then now the, the next thing you have is to combine both of them. Combining a first statement and second statement, you see that the absolute values will fall between the ranges of zero and one. And if you multiply those ones, you'll actually have this as yes. Yes, get. So if that is the case, then actually you do have answer C as the answer. Actually, the E is ruled out as the wrong, as the wrong answer. So all these A, D, B, e, and A are all wrong, and C will be the correct answer for this question. Hope that is understood. You are watching Success with Bob Moiti Show, presented to you by Upstech America. Upstech America is a consulting company that helps immigrants find amazing higher education and job opportunities in the tech industry in the United States. You can find our programs by going to www.upstechamerica.com. Upstech America, we wake you up to the unlimited potential. So let's take a look at the next question as well, which is also a sub 600 level of difficulty. If X, Y, and Z are greater than zero, not put them together, they get a value bigger than zero. Is X greater than zero? No, no, no. This is actually one question which we need to break down first, step the statement before we can be able to determine sufficiency. So to say if, the answer actually, if the value of x is continuously zero, is actually greater than zero, that is yes, or continuously no, it's less than zero. If, it's continuous, if, it's, if it is continuously no, then it is less than zero. Uh, that is, and that will determine sufficiency in this case. So that's what we'll be looking at. So, under what circumstances would x, y, and z multiply together give you a value greater than zero? Not for x only, but let's look at all those digits because you don't know what each one of them could have that value. So if you have, if you actually look at the size that they have, because actually x can be negative or positive. We've not been told if it's an integer or fraction or anything. But what would determine the signs of being greater than or less than zero are the, the signs of these of each and every independent value. So if they're less than zero or greater than zero, that will determine the actual value. So if x is let's say negative negative and negative. If all of them are negative, it will not satisfy. But actually we need to have two negative, one positive, or all of them positive. That is what you need to have. So I don't need to have to go through the whole steps of just stretching all these other ones, just let's just save ourselves the time. So the two conditions we need to have, we need to have at least two digits of them, two, two digits or two values, being negative, because if you multiply a negative and negative, you get a positive. If you multiply a positive and a positive, you get a positive. So in that, in that situation, then you'll have x, y, and z greater than zero. Now, this is what you need not to find out. You just need to find out these conditions. Which ones of these actually have, how, how these conditions satisfied? If you have these satisfied, then actually have a continuously yes. 
If you have this not continuously satisfied, then you have actually continuously no. And those will, will actually will actually contain what is sufficient. But if you have yes or no, then that is not sufficient. So that's what you're looking at. So being told that x, y is greater than zero. What does it say? This means that x and y are both of them are either positive or both of them are negative. In what scenario we will get x, y, or x actually x, y greater than zero. But since you don't know the value of z, if z is negative, if z is negative less than zero, then this whole product will be less than zero, be negative. If it is positive, then actually all this product will be greater than zero. So you have a yes and a no scenario playing out. So that makes this one not sufficient. Yeah. How about the next statement? You have x, z greater than zero. What does this mean? The same, the same analysis as we had in the first one. Either both of them are positive or both of them are negative. But do you know the value of y? Now we don't know what side of the of the, of the of of the number line it is on. So y can be greater than or less than zero. If it is negative, then you don't have actually a continuously. If it is negative, you don't have it continuously no. If it is positive, then it will be continuously yes. So you have the same judgment as you had in the first statement. And so it's not sufficient on its own. But then again, if you combine them together, if you combine them together, that means that x, y greater than zero and x, z is greater than zero. There is no way we will have either of these numbers being negative. So we will rule out the negative aspect in this one, simply because if one of them is to be negative, x, z greater than zero, is actually is less than, is negative, that means x, y will be negative, x, z will be negative, all of them being negative, this will not be greater than zero. It won't satisfy this condition. But if all of them are positive, that means x, y, and z are positive, then this condition will be satisfied. So we need those two together to be able to address our answer. And therefore, our answer choice, correct answer choice will be C, where both statements together are sufficient, but neither statement alone is sufficient. Yeah. Now let's go a notch higher. To 600 to 700 level difficult questions. These questions are, I wouldn't view it as a difficult one, but it varies though. So I think based on those who attempted the question, the sample size taken, majority of people did not get this correct. And those who got it correct were actually in the range of 600 to 700 level. That is where now what places this question in that category. But ideally, I found it to be quite simple, AP. You may also try it and see. So what is the value of integer n? Take note of the word integer, the word n. So that is what we've been told. So to determine sufficiency, n has to be an integer. It can't be a fraction. It can't be, it can't be, what do you call it? A decimal. It can be a fraction, neither can it be a decimal. It has to be an integer. Now, can it be negative? Yes. Can it be positive? Yes. Those are been told, but it has to be an integer. So once you know that one, then now we can go ahead and examine our statements. 0 0.1 is less than 0 0.05, n is less than 0 0.3. And then you have 0 0.2 is less than 0 0.1, n is less than 0 0.4. So let's look at each statement independently. So if actually we normalize, we get rid of the decimals to make it easier to operate with, we multiply all through by 100, we'll have 10 is less than 5n, 5n is less than 30. That is what we'll have out when it actually work the first statement. And we get rid of the decimals just to make it easier. What does this mean? This means that n can be can be equal to what? Uh, 5 times 2 is 10, plus greater than 2 will be 3, 4, or 5. So this is giving us multiple values of n. What is the value? We've been asked for one value, not multiple values. Since it's giving us multiple values, then this is not sufficient. It will not be sufficient. Yeah. This is not sufficient. The first statement was sufficient because we only need to have one value. Again, this comes with the types of, types of questions you get in data sufficiency. They are the yes, no question. Then they are what is the value of? For yes, no questions, it has to be continuously yes or continuously no. Consistently, rather not continuously, but consistently, yes. 
very consistently no and for what is the value it has to be only one value it cannot be there cannot be two values only two it has to be only one value so that is what you need to be looking out for so in this case you're getting multiple values three four and five which satisfy this condition so n can't take all the three values it has to take one so that is not sufficient so given that on the cross of the answer choice a and the d now Let's now go and look at the second statement. Since the small point is just one to remove, to actually get rid of all of them, you just need to multiply by 10. So you have two is less than n less than four. We didn't ask for the value of the integer. So if it's an integer, there's only one integer between two and four, which is three. So n is equal to three. And it's only one, there are no multiple ones. If you're only getting one other value, then this one alone is just sufficient. It is sufficient. Therefore, we rule out the answer choices C and E, the remaining E, B and B is the correct answer. Signature two alone is sufficient, but statement one alone is not sufficient. That is what we're allowed to it. Now let's look at one more question, then you can call it a wrap. If B is greater than 120% of A, is B greater than 70? That's a question being asked. So it's, if B is greater than 1.2A, that is what you've been told, is B greater than 70? That's a question, Margaret. That's a question you need to answer. So for this to happen, Need to find a condition that will lead to a situation where B is greater than 70. That's what we just need to find out. Whether it is A or what. But then again, the second condition to be satisfied is B over A has to be greater than 1.2, 120%. That is what we need to look at the ratios. And though, in as much as it looks like an inequality, it has quite some percentages in it. This is actually a percentages problem. So let's go ahead and assess each statement. So B minus A is 20. B minus A is equal to 20. We don't know what exactly B is, neither do you know what A is, but B has to be greater than 120% of A. And then again, B has to be greater than 70 or less than 70 consistently. So do we have, so this is a yes, no question. Just for, so do you have values that would give us the difference of two numbers being less than 20 at the same time? Okay, not being less than 20, but actually being equal to 20. And at the same time, the ratio of B to A is greater than 1.2. That's a question asking. So let's see. We can have B can be 40 plus 20. And then also the same term uh, can be 30 minus 10. So in both situations, we have 20 as a difference. And, if, and maybe also you check out if you can have the value of B of, of B over A to be greater than 1.2. So 40 over 20 will be 2A. So that will be the, the ratio of the ratio of uh, will be 2, ratio is 2. That's greater than 1.2 as they had given earlier. And 3 for 1, actually 3. So, so for those values less than 70, we're having, we're having this condition being satisfied. That is just as given by the statement. But how about for those that are greater than 70? Let's see. Let's try 80 and 60 is equal to 20. And at the same time also, this is B, this is A. So how about the ratio of, the ratio of uh, both of them? What do you have? So you have 80 over 60. So we'll get three terms till we have four terms. So that will come to 1.33, which the ratio is greater than 1.2. And B minus A is greater than B minus A is equal to 20. And at the same time, B is greater than 70. So we have scenarios where B, if we look at now this side of our this side of our, of our, of our questions, we have 40, 30, and 80. All these conditions we have, they're showing that B in some cases is less than 70, but satisfy the condition given this statement as it is. And B also satisfy the condition and is greater than 70. So again, we're getting a yes and a no 
some situations. So this is actually not sufficient. Okay, now that's, if that is the case, then, then now let us now go back to these statements of ours. If A is, if actually the first statement isn't sufficient, then rule out A, I rule out D. So we left with B, C, and E as the answer choices to look out for. So the second statement says that A is greater than 70. If A is greater than 70, then B is definitely greater than 70, simply because B is 1.2 of A. That is definitely the case. And uh, if, if actually B is greater than 70, then that is actually at the same time given, uh, if at all the, this ratio is, is actually consistent with the limit match, like uh, B is equal to 1.2A. Yeah. Then that means you don't even need to look any further. Just by that statement being said, that A is greater than 70, it automatically qualifies B bigger than 70. And so for the answer will be yes. Yeah, if you have this, the answer will be continuously yes. And therefore, this statement in itself will be sufficient. So if that is the case, then actually you do have an answer as the answer choice B. So we lot also choose C, D, C, D, and E. I have also only answer choice B as the answer. Good. Thank you. That will be the end of this session. And uh, there are no more questions to look at uh, for the two or inequalities. If you have any questions, feel free to share with us under uh, the comments. And we'll a little bit time to be able to address them together and also discuss, discuss with you. And uh, in case of anything, also feel free to share the videos with others and come back again next time to check out all of our videos on how to address various problems. Thank you.